Chargers. Touchdown, UCLA. With USC great and NFL stud, Frosty Rucker. The Trojans back in front. And LAFB founder, Ryan Dyrude on the Believe Podcast Network and LAFBnetwork.com. This is your destination for Los Angeles football. What's up, Los Angeles? Good evening, good afternoon, good morning. Whenever you are listening, welcome into another great episode of Believe in LA Football here on the Believe Podcast Network, always on the LA Football Network, LAFBnetwork.com, your destination for Los Angeles football. Frosty Rucker, my co-host, what is going on? How are you doing today? I'm good, man. Ryan, I'm glad that you have that backdrop. It means a lot. I want a big game this weekend. Yeah, that's my mug. I'm going to change it to yeah. my own, by the way, but I appreciate the respect and thank you, brother. Yeah, I want to get that blown up as like a fat head. I'm like my, in my studio. I may have to <laughs> back on that one. Thank you, man. But yeah, I'm all good. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm just happy my Trojans won. Uh, you know, we'll do a little recap on that. Obviously, uh, Rams won. We know that. Chargers won. We know that. So we're three and one. Yeah, one had to lose. <laughs> right, you know? So, one had to lose. Yeah, so uh, feeling good, man. Yeah, it was uh, – we'll get to all the games. That USC-UCLA game was one of the better ones than I can remember in quite some time. Um, I know last year's was a little closer than what the – or was not as close as even the score indicated, so it was pretty much a blowout the whole game. So this was at least a fun game through and through, and uh, we'll get into more of the implications of that, but – uh, yeah, man, just happy to be talking to you. I'm, I'm, I'm remote. Well, like I said, we're always remote, but I'm, I'm not in L.A. today. So uh, nice. I'm there. there's snow on the ground. So it's a little colder than uh, what I'm used to. But make that coffee, ready to go, ready to talk some L.A. football. That sounds good to me. Let's roll. So as always, the Believe in L.A. Football podcast is brought to you by betonline.ag. Make sure to head there for all of the bets you want to place. Win some extra money this holiday season. They got great prop bets. Obviously, the best money lines and spreads in the business. Um, you know, we got still plenty of football left. Basketball is just around the corner. Does basketball start Christmas Day? Is that when it starts? Yeah, it's coming right now. Uh, preseason games have been exciting. Uh, yeah. Um, what, Clippers and Lakers played this weekend, right? Yeah. Um, Lakers did what they do, and I was happy about that. I love how free agencies hit, and season's here already. Crazy, crazy. I feel like it just ended, but so that's back. Uh, college football, we got bowl season coming up. As weird as it may be, there are going to be bowl games. There is going to be a college playoff, so you can bet on that. Uh, Hockey is going to be starting in January. I know Frosty's second favorite sport there, so make sure to uh, check out the hockey spreads. Uh, but yeah, betonline.ag. Uh, if you haven't signed up, they have great sign up bonuses, so make sure to check that out today. Also, Golden Road Brewery, our good friends just up the road. Whose House Blonde Ale, Bolt Up. Um, golden ale excuse me so they got some great beer choices there covering our teams you can head to the LAFB network locker room to buy directly from there all right frosty so let's get into it. let's start with the chargers who after an abysmal performance against the patriots they did bounce back with a win against the falcons i know there was still a lot of complaining i guess with some of anthony lynn's uh play calling there was an interesting suspect uh you know running play at the end of the second half Bad clock management again, but they got the win. They did beat the Falcons, and uh, they improved their record to four and nine. So let's you know, let's just kind of dwell on the past, kind of look towards the future, and how the rest of the season unfolds as they play three division games starting this Thursday against the Raiders. Um, before we get to that, just tell me your thoughts on Anthony Lynn's situation after another win. Does his does his seat cool a little bit after beating the Falcons? Yeah, man, I think the seat cools a little bit. I think if uh, they can win at least two more of these games and get them to six wins on the season. Uh, that's closer to 500 as you know they can get. I don't think they win all of them, but um, I think it helps them. It helps his cause because, let's face it, they did have injuries. They had a lot of injuries on both sides of the ball, uh, really good football players that missed a lot of time. And they gotten some guys back, but they've been out of rhythm. And the out of the rhythm part is this season. You know, so uh, hopefully being an Anthony Lynn fan, um, they have time to go over things and give them one more year. But if they go out here and they shoot an egg, I don't think it becomes pretty by January 1st. Yeah. Yeah. I think this year, Black Monday, as they call it, is on I think January 4th or something. So that'll be a, a bummer new year for a lot of coaches. And, and Lynn may be one of them. You know, um, 
I've been hearing from friends of mine that covered the Chargers since they've been in San Diego that know a lot more about the Spanos family than I do just, you know, covering the team now for a few years since they've been in LA. Yeah. And a lot of them think that because Anthony Lynn has one year left on his contract, because he's owed $7 million still, that the Spanos family is too cheap to fire him and pay him <laughs> $7 million just to sit at home and chill and then hire another coach. No, I know you don't know anything about the situation, but what are just your thoughts on that? Is that just silly owner? I mean, I'll be, let's be real. It's extremely silly management. It's extremely silly ownership if it's not going to win you games. But just what do you think of that? Is that just the worst excuse ever to not move on? Or does that more so say that they believe Anthony Lane could actually turn it around? I, I, I'm right in the middle of that. Um, teams do this all the time just because things become business and financially they look at it and, uh, it always goes back to do these teams, their ultimate goal is to win it all, right? Or is yeah. it just to build a team, be competitive, and that's about it. Uh, I don't think them bringing Anthony Lynn back means they don't believe in him. But I also look at a financial way. Why pay a guy close to $10 million to sit at a house or be on TV uh, being able to critique the team he left? So <laughs> Yeah. Because that's usually what happens. They pick him up, and then he can critique the team on the opening mm -hmm. night. And if they lose, it's like, well, I wasn't the problem, right? Yeah. So wasn't me. Uh, I'm right in the middle of it. I think he he wins two of these last three games. Uh, they bring him back, and he can come back with confidence and uh, not looking over his shoulder. Yeah, I think uh, so. They play the Raiders this Thursday which the Raiders are kind of tumbling right now. So they are like, they're going to be playing hard. They need to win to keep their playoff. Yeah. They're going to need, need to need to win out kind of to keep their playoff hopes alive. Cause the AFC teams are starting to kind of separate from where the Raiders are after a couple a uh, skid there. But I think if the, if the chargers, even if they were to lose to the Raiders and the Broncos, if they beat the chiefs, the best team in all of football in the last game of the season, I think that strangely and what chargers fans do not want to hear may save Lynn's job because they'll say, okay, we end on a high note. We beat the best team in the NFL. We see what we are capable of. And that might give them enough to bring him back another year, which I know me and you both root for the guy. We love him. Um, I, I would like to see him improve things. I just don't know if they're past that point. Um, so let me ask you this. We talked a little bit pre-show. And so I know that during your tenure, you really didn't have any coaching changes on your teams, but just being in a locker room, can you think of any times when there was any uncertainty or just, from experience, just kind of thinking about or talking to friends, what's it like being in a locker room when you don't know if your head coach is going to be there week to week? Because I know everyone says Lynn's probably going to finish the season, but, you know, we don't know that. He could get fired after Thursday if they get blown up by the Raiders. What's that like as a player? Uh, it's kind of on the edge because you kind of feel for the coach. Um, I've never been in a, a, a complete scenario like that, but when I played in Cincinnati where I got drafted to, uh, we had a couple seasons we weren't really that good. So, you know, the, the chatters around, oh, Marvin's not going to be here. That's mm -hmm. Coach Lewis, by the way. You, you, you don't know what's going on. But then at the same time, you're trying to worry about yourself because that coach brought you there. So it may be like, well, he brought you. You're gone too, right? So as a player, it's, it's a difficult thing because everyone's protecting their own jobs. But you yeah. do feel for a guy. But then you always got to step back as a player and be like, would he care if it was me? Yeah. Right? When and, cut me. Uh, yeah. you know, there's a silver lining there. It's like, I don't know if he would actually care or if he would lose any sleep the way I would if I lost mine. So um, it puts everyone a little on edge. You, you want to work hard for the guy just because you believe in him. He's been really consistent, been in front of the, the, the team, hasn't really thrown anyone under the bus. Um, mm -hmm. He's taken everything on the chin, so to say, the wins, the losses. Um, he takes it all. You know, bad play calling, he hears it. And even his responses, you know, they're going to be on football follies one day, you know? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. you know what I mean? So uh, he's been a great sport about it. I, I hope to see him again. I hope they finish out these last three games. Hell, I wish they would win them all. I'm a Raider because I play there once a Raider, always a Raider. Uh, do I think they can win this game? I think it's going to be a slugfest. The Raiders aren't playing that good. They are, yeah. but they're having their moments. They just fired their defensive coordinator, Paul Gunther. Um, so they got a little bit of stuff going on. We'll see how uh, Coach Rod Marinelli does with this, this group. He's the D-line coach. Now he'd be the acting defensive coordinator. 
Um, then they got the Broncos. I think that could be a win. And it's going to be at home, not in Denver. So mm-hmm. that'll look at it that way. And the hardest one is the Chiefs. I don't think they win in Arrowhead at the end of the season. I think um, they'll be their last breakdown as a group would be like one, two, three, Cancun. You know, I think <laughs> it, I think it's over and um, the season will be over. But hopefully, yeah. if they win two of these games, again, I'm a Raider. But if they win these two games, I think that that's enough to get them to six wins and keeps Anthony's job. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting. And and if they don't, if they, you know, obviously if you fire the coach, you obviously everyone's fired and it's up to the new coach to bring back any staff. I wouldn't suspect any of the coordinators would be up for the head coaching job just because if you are going to move on from Lynn, I think it, you move on from this entire staff, unless someone brings back like a Pep Hamilton or, or a Shane Steichen on the offensive side of the ball. But, um, you know, speaking of Marvin Lewin real quick, who is now the right now the co-defensive coordinator for ASU? You see uh, the beatdown they put on Arizona on Wednesday. Oh, they got them good. They, you know, they didn't. I don't think they played for like two or three weeks. So they had you know a lot built up, and they really took it. They, another rivalry game. They took to the third degree on them. You know, and I, that's the way you're supposed to play these games. The, those rivalry games that can go either yeah. way. And I didn't. I thought the teams were so evenly matched that it wouldn't be like that. But boy, they, you know, when they actually show up and they can finish the games off, they're a talented team. They've recruited great players uh, from the West Coast, and they're rocking. Yeah, cost Kevin Sumlin his job at Arizona. When you lose seventy to seven to your rivalry, it's probably going to cost a lot of people their jobs. So, um, but yeah, Chargers. So yeah, they get the win. I know we didn't talk much about the game, but it's more looking towards the future for the Chargers and Chargers fans as they play the Raiders this Thursday coming up. Uh, should be a good game. Um, I yeah, like you said, I think if they can win two or three, or even if they beat the Chiefs, the interesting thing with the Chiefs game is, will the Chiefs be have clinched the number one seed where they can rest guys, or will they be fighting with someone to take? Because you know, this year only yeah. the first seed gets a bye. Only the first seed, right? Yeah, only the first seed gets a bye, so it's very important. So, so if they're still battling, obviously the Chiefs are going to be playing very hard and importantly and playing all their starters if they've clinched by a game or two then we may see backups and the Chargers can get a win to win out the season but um either way we'll obviously be monitoring that the rest of the season on the coach Lynn's hot seat so let's move on to the Los Angeles Rams the other direction Chargers are four nine Rams are now nine and four after uh beating the Patriots it it was funny how it happened how the Patriots dismantled the Chargers at SoFi a week ago 45 nothing and then played four days later in SoFi against the Rams, and the Rams completely dismantled them 24-3. to Patriots offense looked all out of whack. Could what? not do nothing against the uh, the Rams defense, and the Rams offense, you know, was was efficient. Cam Akers had his first 100-yard game, had almost his first 200-yard game running the ball, and uh, they, they really continued to supplant themselves as one of the top teams in the NFC. So, Frosty, let me just ask you this. Are they the best team in the NFC? Oh, they're right in the mix. I'll say that. And, um, you know, they still got the um, the Seahawks in their own division that are really talented and can win a game any – can win a game any Sunday if they play and they match up the right way. And Russell Wilson has a day and DK Mm -hmm. Metcalf uh, plays. Still holes in the defense, but you have the Seahawks there. But you got the the Packers. You got the Saints. They're having outstanding seasons. Even the Saints with the backup quarterback with Drew Brees not even in there right now are playing good football. Yeah, they just lost, but they're playing good football still. So are the Rams best? Yeah, we've talked so much about the highs and lows of this Rams team. And now when all the chips are on the table, it looks like they're in the top tier of the NFL. So uh, this is it's hard to really lay out what Rams team – it is, but right now it looks like they're building. They're, um, they've won the last three in a row, so I'll take it. Yeah, yeah, I, I think they are. Just from top to bottom, I think they can be argued as the best team in the NFL. I know that the Saints would have something to say about that, who are, like you said, playing really well with a backup QB and Taysom Hill. Yeah. Um, they're, you know, Alvin Kamara is tremendous. They still have Mike Thomas. So when Drew Brees is back, it's interesting to see what the offense will look like. Cause with him out, it's been a completely different offense. I mean, they run it completely differently. Kudos to Sean Payton for essentially, you know, getting a whole new playbook for Taysom Hill. But um, who's to say when uh, Bruce Reese comes back, the offense is better. I mean, 
I love Drew Brees and a surefire Hall of Famer, but at 41 years old, like maybe it regresses a little bit. Who knows? Because I think with Taysom Hill, there's a lot of unknown there when you go up uh, defensively against him. So, so that's a team. And then when you have Green Bay and Aaron Rodgers, how good he is. But then they've shown lapses too. So, I mean, each team has shown like greatness and each team has shown like, what the hell was that game? So I think it's, it's hard to really say who is the top team in the NFC. Um, but I think the Rams, like you said, are right there in it. And I think the defense – right now is the best defense in the NFC, which is, I think, what's most important come playoff time. And that's why I think they have a real shot at making that Super Bowl push, which I don't think anyone had projected come opening of the season. <laughs> right, right. And no one but themselves. And as I stand corrected, that was the last three out of four games the Rams have won. Um, so I wanted to correct myself there. Um, yeah, their, their defense is playing great. That dog work up, up front is balling. Mm-hmm. Linebacker Corp is coming together. And that defensive backfield is uh, – really shutting people out. Um, obviously, they just play versus a not too threatening uh, Patriots offense, but nevertheless, they did what they're supposed to do and beat the team the way they're supposed to be beat. And um, the Rams are rolling right now, and I like them in their upcoming matchups. Yeah, I, I texted you during the game. Our guy, Eric Henderson, D-line coach, um, another really kind of hot name right now, Aubrey Pleasant, he's the secondary coach, and Joe Barry, who's the linebacking coach uh, for the Rams. Do you think, I mean, Eric Henderson, he, he's a young guy, new guy, you play with him, but do you think he could be up for a, a potential D coordinator position? We're going to see probably, I think, six to eight new head coaches this cycle, which is, you know, obviously a lot. And they're all going to be looking for new D coordinators, the new fresh mind, and what he's done with that D line. Do you think he has a shot to be a D coordinator? Yeah. I hope not for the Rams' sake, but. Yeah, if you follow uh, Eric's uh, history, the last couple of years, he was with the Chargers. They, they did a great job. Now he's with the Rams. They're doing a phenomenal mm-hmm. job. Uh, he's really good at what he does. That may be a question we have to ask him, you know, yeah. because a lot of people like to be where they're at, master it, which I, seems like he's done. You master mm-hmm. it, and then you elevate. But we don't know what's in his plans, right? I, w- I would be one of the first people, just like yourself, to vouch for him. He should get an interview, right? Yeah. But especially totally. in a place where, you know, they're trying to interview more minorities in positions and get them – uh, had jobs and giving them a real look at things, why wouldn't his name not come up? You know, everything on his resume looks great to me. Yeah, you know, I would hate to see him leave just because of him being in L.A. and what he's done for the Rams, but I think he definitely deserves a shot because a lot of people from the outside will just point to, yeah, when you have Aaron Donald, it makes your job a whole lot easier, which, yeah, is true when you have the best player in the game. But seeing what he's done with, you know, a Morgan Fox, a Sebastian Joseph Day, exactly. even Michael Brockers, who is always a Pro Bowl talent at the run stopping, but he's been way more involved in the pass rush. I think he has a career year in sacks this year. Um, obviously, Leonard Floyd, who came over, who's more in the linebacking room, but still has some influence from Henderson. Um, so I just think what he's done with the other players really speaks volumes on what he's been able to do. And they're the, they're the top unit, I think, in the NFL. I don't know if you can argue a better unit than, than his. No, I, I think they're, they're, uh, they're doing exactly what – they set out to do. And, um, you know, it, it'll be a real test uh, for me uh, to see what type of defense uh, Coach Henny would run. Would he run the 3 4 or 4 3? What, what would be mm-hmm. his preference? You know, because um, he has to coach, he had to coach both, right? Um, yeah. So I would love to, you know, chat it up with him and hear, but I know his football mind. We came in the same uh, class in Cincinnati in the 06. Uh, uh, class and um, I know his football and that, that's why he's in the position he is because he knows great football he's played great football and um, I know where his mind is so I would love to just pick his brain on that and uh, see where where he's at with it yeah let me add just because I'm curious because so many couch coaches are always so big on well he runs a three four so he can't come players won't fit in that he runs a four three yada 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 how actually do you think I mean I think you you played primarily what in a four three technically. I played in a four three the majority of my year in Arizona for five years. I played three four inside. Okay, so how do you think actually important is that, or is it now coaches run out of they don't even run out of base so much that it really doesn't mean that much, or is it still very important? To to what specialize in either or? Yeah, so for instance, for instance, say the Chargers are a four three right now. If they fire their staff. Is it very important to bring in a guy who's a 4-3 guy or does it really not mean a whole lot if they bring in a 3-4 guy and just kind of mold it around? Because you know a lot of coaches too, even like a Wade Phillips, technically runs a 3-4, but it's more of a 4-3 with a stand-up end. It's, it, they're, they're very like interchangeable. And yeah, like, how but, important is that, that moniker 3-4 or 
I don't think nowadays it, it, it is because so many different packages, like you said, people don't really run base too much. You know, they run some form of nickel and um, how you move guys around and align them, your sandbackers and stuff. A lot of teams are running unders and, you know, so I, I don't think it, it, it matters. I think all D-line coaches can do it. And yeah. I think, um, it's all your personnel, you know. If you got a guy like Bosa and he's not afraid to be in a four eye or three and rush from in there, you're in business. You know what I mean? Because there's a lot of one on ones in there. If you go a bare front and you put a guy over the nose, you put two threes. You know, I played in a bare front at 280. I took on double teams with guard and tackles, and I got a lot of one on ones. I got a lot of sacks because I can run the TE games with the end outside. And it's all about your your personnel if they're they're willing to commit to you know the scheme. Yeah, See, that's what I want to hear more of. I love hearing when you talk scheme and stuff. So hopefully we'll get some some fill breakdown here soon. But, but yeah, no, I agree. I think better you... questions, Ryan. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, but no, I, I think even to Coach Henny's just talking him up more is you've seen even in game adjustments where I know Aaron Donald Aaron Donald's technically a D tackle, but there's been a lot of instances where they actually line him up on the outside more uh, to get that you know on tackle. Uh, adjustment which obviously they're no match for so I think uh, he's even shown adjustments on the D line that shows he can really I think coach any scheme and be okay with that with no matter where he ended up yeah I mean just by doing that they could be trying to free someone else up you know going totally. each week if we're going to be talking schemes and uh, how to dial things up you go in to see who is the worst blocker on the team a lot of the times it's the center but you know once the season gets going and people are getting hurt you got guys going in that are coming off the street, haven't played, and they're getting thrown in games. So it could be the guard. And how do you isolate those guys? But maybe drawing Aaron Donald on one side at end, the line will slide and leave that guard or tackle one-on-one -on -one with Leonard Floyd, and that's the win that they want. You, yeah. know, you know, sometimes guys are decoys. So it's just all about the coaching and how they do it, and uh, that's the genius of coaches, how they use their personnel the right way. Absolutely. Yeah. So, well, it'd be a big loss. And, uh, but I just wanted to bring that up because I think that there'll be some hot names and, and I just want to shout out Aubrey Pleasant too, because guys like Darius yeah. Williams and Troy, Troy Hill, who are having yeah. tremendous seasons. Season. I mean, he, yeah, exactly. So I think he'll be a hot name as well in that D coordinator realm. So, um, but yeah, for us, those Rams, we got the jets this week. I mean, every, any given Sunday, I think we chalk that up as a win. And then uh, they finished with two division games with the uh, Seahawks and Cardinals. So this is definitely a team that can finish 12 and four, 11 and five, if they slip up on one and should be at least fighting for that number one seed or for sure top two. And the Cardinals, you got to expect them to be very scrappy in that matchup because they're a team on the brink of a wild card trying to get in and they kind of went through a down spiral. So, you know, these division games are going to be hard fought and, um, I can't wait this last stretch of this NFL season. Yeah. Frost, you need to get like on a Zoom call because both your former teams are on a little slide right now. You need to rah rah them up a little bit. Might have to. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, yeah. So Rams and uh, Chargers both do win. Uh, Rams face the Jets coming up. Should be a good one. Make sure to grab some Golden Road Who's House for the next game. Um, so, Frost, let's, let's jump now to your other former team, the Victory Bell matchup, UCLA, USC. I was at the Rose Bowl. Just first talk to me what you thought of the game. I, I enjoyed the hell out of it. Hell out of it. What did you just think of the game? I enjoyed it. I was on the edge of my seat the whole game. Uh, this was another game that almost threw my phone a few times. Uh, <laughs> I thought I would have no communication, so I had to think about it. Um, <laughs> Important. No, great game. Uh, I'm sure uh, just like we knew going into it, the excitement of it uh, would be there, uh, the highs and lows. I thought the – game was going to be on the opposite side, uh, like a lopsided towards the end of the game with USC, you know, taking the lead and just extending it. Didn't happen. Mm -hmm. UCLA really showed up. Uh, and our guy, uh, Felton, another outstanding game. And uh, yep. his dra draft stock just has to just continue to rise. You know, yeah. The more they get Two touchdowns before, again. Yeah. I mean, he just shows up, you know. And that was the guy that I was going to the game like. We have to stop him because if he gets busy – and then DTR showed up. DTR yeah. had a phenomenal game besides, you know, uh, that interception and then the, well, the two interceptions, one for a touchdown. But besides that, the three-quarters uh, UCLA was whooping USC's ass. 
and yeah. I actually went on betonline.ag. I bet the spread. I bet the win, and I was nervous. <laughs> yeah. Well, good. Where, where'd you Where'd you watch the game? Who were you with? Were you just by yourself? Was, dark, are you one of those guys that? I was by myself for this one. Um, okay. I was completely dialed in, tuned in, and uh, I was. You know, the phone was working. The group chats were going. You were texting me about certain plays, and um, it was just one of those games. You know, we knew how exciting it was going to be, just yeah. the rivalry and all that. But who knew UCLA was really going to show up? And 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 I loved it. You know, as of late, I've said UCLA is a lot better. Mm, you yeah. have. Quote that. We got it on tape. So they're yeah. a lot better. And, you know, going into that game, I was like, if Chip Kelly loses that one, maybe he gets fired. I think this was such a, a great game that it helped both teams in L.A. with recruiting. And I think it was one of those games that we personally needed. And I know UCLA is going to benefit from it also. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I love that uh, in your Take Back the West podcast, you had a, a powerhouse episode with legends, Lendell White, Lopin Atupu, Keith, um, tons and tons of guys on that show. And I love, as they should, but every guy was like, oh, yeah, USC is going to smack them. Blah. I think Lendell White said like 42 to 17 or something, right. um, as they should. You were the one that said, I think this game's going to be close. I think it's going to be a close, hard-fought game because yeah, I think you've watched a little more UCLA now. And it was. I mean, I, I thought – USC was going to win going into it. I just think they're right now the better team, but I thought UCLA was going to play well and compete. And the defense, like we talked about in the last episode, is much improved, which was the, the Thor. I know they gave up 43 points, but they, they played a lot better. I mean, Keaton Slovis had two turnovers. Um, they, they were able to shut down for stretches in the game, just not when it mattered. And that's what mattered. That's what USC, a lot of people have, you know, harped on. I'm like, well, they don't get going until later. They keep coming back. But I think that's what shows a good team is when it matters, they show up and they make plays and these receivers make plays. And, you know, Drake London, who's probably going to be a first or second round pick come when he's ready to go out. He's only a sophomore. Like, dude's a beast. And Amon Ra had another great game. Tyler Vaughn's another great game. The running game was efficient when needed to be. It wasn't the focal point as usual. Um, but I, you know, I want to give some kudos to UCLA who, you know, DTR only had six incompletions. Two of those were interceptions, unfortunately. One of them was a tip, uh, which wasn't totally, I guess, his fault, but still falls on him. Um, but uh, I thought uh, they just played – they played hard, felt another two touchdowns, like you said. And uh, so talk to me about – you mentioned that recruiting will be better. Obviously, USC now sitting undefeated. They're playing for the Pac-12 championship. We talk about taking back the West. That's the name of your podcast, the background you see it. So that they're really going to put an onus on recruiting. But how does this game help UCLA in recruiting? Because I agree with you, but talk to everyone out there how a loss can actually help your program for recruiting. Well, a, a hard slug match of a, a game like that, A, it's the confidence in the coach. No one's talking about Chip Kelly on the, the hot seat right now, right? He played toe-to-toe -to -toe with a very good team, so we say, uh, in USC. Um, it helps with recruiting because a lot of people were tuned in. Not everyone was out and about and whatnot just because you can right? In California, you can't be out and about right now. So yeah. the city already shuts down when this game is played. Everyone's in the living room, I'm sure, watching this, this game, and there's all these recruits that could be like, well, you know, I, looking at rosters, do I have a better shot going here and playing? I don't want to leave now. Everything's so uncertain with COVID and everything. I want to stay near home. Uh, which team is it? You know, and I think for both teams, it serves a huge purpose that they played the way they did um, and it went down to the wire the way it did. And those are the games of a pass that has built the programs up, being in these slug fest of games between each other uh, with hatred and all that, but at the same time with a lot of local kids. So I just, I just really feel like recruiting uh, is going to elevate both these teams in L.A. Yeah, I think so too. And especially if USC can can lock in the Pac-12 championship and they still do have a path for the for the playoff. It's a tough one, but you never know. I mean, crazier things have happened. Um, and it scares me though, you know? And no, yeah. I'm gonna be completely real and I'm, a, you know, obviously I'm gonna cut it real. Um, it scares me because I love how we're five and oh, I love the opportunity to play Oregon. That's something we talked about at the beginning of the year. If SC mm -hmm. wins games, six games, but they didn't get one. If they win these six games and they get in this championship, probably versus Oregon, you know, that's the, the matchup everyone wants to see. So it's playing the way it wanted to, but yeah. I'd rather leave it on a good note than going, and I'm not sure if our fourth quarter heroics win versus 
a Clemson or if they win versus a Notre Dame or if they win versus – I don't know if it does because, for me, SC tends to play down to the opponent's level instead of always mm-hmm. – just dominating. And I'm not saying yeah. we always got to dominate by 20 and stuff like that, but it just seems a little lopsided and they go tip for tat, slug for slug. Yeah. And with a really, really, really good team, I'm not sure they can make those comebacks. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't think anyone's beaten Alabama this year. Um, that's probably not happening, but, but I would love, I, I do just because of the his, history of it and the rivalry, if somehow they snuck in and were able to face Notre Dame in that first playoff game, I mean, what a phenomenal game would that be? That would be huh. right. And, and, and I'm not saying, and I'm not counting SC out of anything by any means. Oh, for sure. Yeah. There's some really, really, really talented teams that haven't been through what SC has been through. Mm-hmm. And even starting so late, some, they all started early, you know? So the wear and tear, the, you know, the confidence going into it, uh, those SEC teams and stuff, they, they look good. You know, I can't yeah. get front. They do look good. And they look strong, fast, and those that's what we're trying to get back to. And that's why we're trying to take back the West, right? So I'd rather leave the season on a high note, beat Oregon, and it's like, oh, we didn't get in, but yeah, recruiting's gonna go up. But if we go to a bowl game and get smacked or something, I feel like it can only do damage at this point. And I'm just trying to build back my program. Yeah. I think it'd be better to it'd be probably better to yeah beat Oregon and then maybe play like a Wisconsin in the Rose Bowl or something where I think they can I think they match up well and um, do all that so uh, yeah it'll be interesting to see uh, these coaches you had said a few episodes ago you think Chip Kelly's job hinged on beating SC I know we talked during the game and afterwards but you you think he's because of the way it played out you think he's safe right yeah I think he's safe I mean they've won games. Um, and they've gotten better. And we, we, we talked about that when they weren't winning games and, you know, they sucked it up the first game. It, you, you know, it was yeah. a lot different. But um, yeah. I think the team is a lot more better. They've had the same offensive line stick together and not a lot of injuries there. And, you know, DTR, if he's on fire, we've seen what he's capable of doing. Mm-hmm. Chase Griffin gets a shot. He can lead this offense down the field. They can score points and get the ball to Felton which should yeah. be key each and every week, each and every day of practice. Um, he has something. He yeah. has to find another Felton. Felton's out of here, and he's going to go make a lot of money. they got to mm-hmm. find another playmaker like that, but here's where that recruiting comes from. So I really feel like this is the, the peak time, and I think that game said enough to the new AD over there at UCLA that Chip Kelly can be the guy there, and especially if the – the, the kids standing on the table for them. It could yeah, be the no, I agree. same type of thing that happened to SC last year with Clay Helton getting a new mm-hmm. AD during the year. How's this play out? He gets this one more year and we'll see how it goes from there. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think, uh, I think what most important we saw a uh, vast improvement on defense, um, which they were horrible last year. So that was improvement. And we saw really chips true offense this year that they've been trying to get working and it just really didn't click the last two years. And this year we finally saw it evolve and become like a chip Kelly offense that uh, we wanted to see. I think it's, I think it'd be great if DTR returns another year for his own draft stock and for this team, if he can come back as a senior, um, obviously felt will be gone. So I'll have to replace him, but the offensive line should pretty much all be intact. They're super young offensive line. Um, they're, you know, receiving cores, sophomores. So they got a lot of talent coming back next year that they can build upon. And I think uh, he should be the guy to, to at least let's see them fully healthy with a true off season and see what they can do. And then maybe address after that year. Plus he still has like a lot of money on his contract. I don't think UCLA wants to do a buyout like someone like Auburn just did with Gus Nelson. So I don't think they'll be doing that. Um, last question. And we'll just, you know, let's, we got to talk at least Clay Hilton a little bit. I think the Trojans, you know, five and oh, they've, they've shown a lot. I think Clay Hilton's shown a lot. I know there's still a high contingency of Trojan fans that want to still move on, even though they're five and zero, they're not happy. Do you like what you've seen from Clay Hilton? Do you think he's I do. he's obviously got to be safe? You're not going to fire him at five and zero, but do you he's think he's been, shown enough? You know, I think Clay's doing a great job. Uh, a lot of people are up in arms. And, you know, you can go through a course of a game and read blogs, and now we're kind of like I'm a blogger now, I guess. You can read the <laughs> blogs, and you know, you can listen to everyone, and like, oh, this team can't tackle. It's Clay's fault. Oh, they didn't catch that ball. It's Clay's fault. They yeah. didn't run that. That's Clay's fault. Some of this has to go on these coaches and the players. And I yeah. think um, Clay's doing a great job letting Graham do what he does is be the offensive coordinator. He's not 
bugging him. He's not, you don't see any friction on the sideline in that manner. Clay's mm-hmm. doing exactly what he's supposed to do, pumping this team up, getting them going. Do we want to see other things? Yes. As you know, I, I played 13 years in the NFL. I'm sure there's other plays that I, you know, could draw up or I see like, hey, run this play, right? Couch coach. Yeah. How about yep. you let them do their job? I think Clay's doing a great job. Uh, we're, we're seeing Todd Orlando, how he finishes games and how his guys rally. We got a pick six. It had to be the coverage. You know what I mean? It, it's it's the good things are coming out of it, and they're five and zero. Oh, so I don't understand all the hatred for Clay. You know, everyone just thinks that. Would you want to do lose the game so you can just blame him? Yeah, He's five yeah. and zero. Oh. Clay Hilton is five and zero, oh, and so is your Trojans. And um, the Trojans got to finish this off. They got to win the sixth game versus Oregon. And whatever happens after that happens. But hopefully they just go 6-0. and <clears throat> You know, a side of me wants to see playoffs, but there's another side of me that just wants to keep rebuilding our team. Yeah. And I don't want to see anything happen to damage those abilities with recruiting. Yeah. I agree with you, yeah. And uh, I think the most important thing about this team is the fight they have, and I think that does come to coach. And we talked about a lot about the season with Anthony Lynn, and I think that shows with Coach, coach Clay Helton is the fight these players have, but they've actually closed games out, which is a, a tribute to coaching and to these players. So um, big game against Oregon, Friday night. It's at the Coliseum, actually. Usually it would be up at Levi Stadium for the Pac-12 championship, but because of their restrictions, uh, they try to get another home game at the Cali. So I like the chances, and I think it's going to be a good game. And – We'll talk probably more later in the week, but I think uh, I think the Trojans do finish this out as Pac-12 champs, but I, I like what I've seen so far. I, I think so, too. I think it's an evenly matched game as talent-wise because Oregon still has talent, but they have lost two games, and I feel like the Trojans have that confidence going, and they'll steamroll, and I think you know playing in the Coliseum means a lot to these guys. It meant a lot yeah. to me, and I think that's a determining factor. I'm glad it's not in SoFi or something where it's – you know, kind of even, no mm-hmm. fair, bigger space, different. You know, every time we travel and we're playing in Texas in a big old stadium or something, it doesn't fare well for the Trojans. <laughs> so yeah. I'm glad it's at the Coliseum, and, I, and I'm looking forward to it. It's, it'll be a great Friday night to sit back, watch this game, and just be excited. Yeah, I'm excited too, and then we'll see if they end up at playing at the Rose Bowl yet again or somewhere else. But um, – Frosty, I think that's a good uh, a good ending point for the, uh, I guess we can call it the recap show, but more of the looking to the future show of the LA Football Podcast. Where can everyone find you at, Frost? You can find me at The Organic Frost, or you can go check me out on Take Back the West Podcast. That's Take Back the West and it's underscore on Instagram. Uh, all of our episodes are up at the LAFBnetwork.com. Uh, you can see our, our, we're on YouTube. You can just check us out. So keep subscribing. We appreciate the love and let's keep this thing rolling. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, follow me at Ryan Dyer at LAFB. The main account is LAFB network, LAFB network.com for both the LA football podcast and take back the West podcast. Plus plenty of articles covering Rams, Trojans, Chargers, and Bruins. I uh, hope everyone has a fina- fina- phenomenal week. And uh, we'll definitely talk to you soon. Make sure to subscribe to the show wherever you listen. We are everywhere you listen to podcasts, video platforms on YouTube, like Frosty said, Facebook and Instagram, all at LAFB Network. Frost, my man, thanks so much. Looking forward to talking to you again later in the week. Absolutely. Happy holidays. All right, guys. Take care.